Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to How Can Donors Best Support Police Reform in a Non-Western Contexts? Uh, my name is John Jackson. I'm a professor in research methodology at the London School, School of Economics. You might ask why I'm doing this. Well, my, my research is in policing, so I'm connected to the Mannheim Centre for Criminology. I just happen to be in a methodology department. This, More importantly, um, this event is uh, hosted by LSE Ideas, uh, the Institute for Global City Policing. Um, and the Urban Violence Research Network has been convened by Dr. Liam O'Shea at LSE and Dr. Zohar Wasim at UCL. So this is the final of four sessions examining how to reform the police. Um, the first session was hosted uh, by King's College London, and that looked at police reform in the Global South broadly, examining what works to reduce police malpractice and the importance of local context. The second session looked at what contributes to successful organisational um, level change and the third session explored what makes police reform and police reform uh, movements successful. So today we examine the effective ways that donors can um, support police reform in the, the global south. The opportunity for donors to successfully impact reform varies from context to context um, but research and interventions constitutes a large body of the research on police in non-Western contexts. So our, our distinguished panel includes experts with extensive experience researching donors' impacts vis-a-vis -vis other drivers of police transformation. It also includes uh, practitioners who have worked with police organisations in Africa, the Middle East and former Soviet Union, who, and who have first-hand experience delivering overseas development assistance in support of security and justice. Um, objectives. So with, with no further ado, I am going to um, introduce the first uh, first uh, 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 panellist, first speaker. Um, so the first speaker is Alice Hills and the title is, as you'll see uh, when, when we move to the slides, um, the challenges facing and opportunities open to donors seeking to influence police reform in the global south. So Alice Hills is visiting professor at the University of Leeds, uh, previously a professor of conflict studies at Durham and of conflict and security at Leeds. Uh, her research is on police community relations in Somalia, Somaliland and Kenya and was recently funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. More broadly, her research interests include police development, post-conflict policing and exploration of police forces patterns of evolution and change. She's published widely on these topics um, with her works including policing post-conflict cities and making Mogadishu safe. So over to you, Alice. Thank you very much, John. Well, a few years ago, an American academic working for the World Bank in Equatorial Guinea asked a disillusioned Colombian colleague why on earth she was working on a programme she regarded as absolutely futile. And her answer to him is actually very relevant for this meeting today because, slide please, this is what she said. Slide, please. Looks as though the slides got lost, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read it out. She said, at the top, no one cares. Oh, here we are. Okay, that, that was the Colombian colleague's response. And I think it's so relevant for what we're talking about today, because really she provides the only realistic excuse, I think, or reason or rationale for operating in this particular world. Whatever the case, her quote actually sets the tone for the next 10 minutes, because it's a salutary reminder that takes us directly to the challenges confronting donors who want to actually implement assistance plans in some of the places where actually liberal democracies really aren't necessarily much of a model. I'm not saying that assistance, by the way, doesn't work, that it can't work. It can especially when it involves transferring the skills associated with, quote, proper policing to elite units in particular. That's the, you know, the event investigative techniques, bomb disposal and so on. You, know, just, you just have to ask Turkey or the US and you can see that's the case, or indeed perhaps the EU, EU's new European peace facility. But overall, I can't help thinking that the results of, of aid and assistance programmes tend to be superficial, temporary and local. But we know this, so there's no point in me hammering on about it. It makes much more sense today to look at the more creative possibilities, or at least some of the marginally more creative possibilities associated with assistance. And both are particularly evident in Somalia, which is an extreme example you can get. And it's the one I actually want to look at today. 
slide, please. This is just a street in Mogadishu. It just gives you a flavour of what we're actually talking about. I think one of the reasons actually why Somalia is particularly interesting for us here is because its experience reflects the difference between policing delivered by the state, which has been a dominant theme so far in the seminars, and policing delivered through social processes in a chronically insecure and, very important, legally plural society. I'm not going to go on about Somalia's problems because they're so well known. Yes, it's an incredibly entrepreneurial and resilient society. It is also a patriarchal and very violent clan based society that much prefers opaque and informal decision making to the accountability and institution, institution based approach preferred by donors. So it really isn't surprising that the billions of dollars, euros, sterling, yen, lira, and renminbi devoted to assistance programs have actually made remarkably little difference to the majority of Somali's lives. Let's face it, donors can't really do much to influence the thinking of the average untrained, illiterate, militia-oriented Somali policeman. Slide, please. Despite this, there are actually some great examples of donors offering positive and pragmatic use of assistance to facilitate a more internationally and also locally appropriate form of policing. And I've got two examples that I want to use to give you a flavour. The first is a neighbourhood watch scheme in Mogadishu's Wabiri district in the mid 2010s. And the second is a, a basic policing scheme introduced into Kuzmaya and Baidera at much the same sort of time. And together they show how donors such as DFID can actually support policing provision. And I assume, by the way, that we're really talking about DFID here rather than, say, Turkey or Egypt or their equivalents. So have a look first at Mogadishu, just to, to offer the example. It's because it's a great example of very small scale assistance that actually made a difference. Only for a short time, but it really worked. And despite it relying on, amongst others, different US advisors, it was a Somali-driven scheme, and that's important. So if you just imagine Neighborhood Watch, I don't really know, need to go into the details, but it's, it, Imagine it's a pyramid. Um, it's a structured household level approach that actually tried to, to facilitate intelligence gathering at the local level. It was basically actually surveillance for anti-terrorism purposes, but it did in fact improve community relations enormously. It was successful partly because it built on a popular model already used in Mogadishu, and partly because it was supported not only by the many local women, and polygamy, polygamy means that there are a lot of women-led households, who wanted to protect their sons from Al Shabaab's influence, but also by the mayor, local police officers, and district officer, district officials. And for a year or two, it was very, very successful. It really did improve local community relations. It improved community morale no end. Slide, please. And it even led to an increase in house prices and rents, which is good as evident as as good an evidence as you can find. So you can see it got very jolly at times. Yes, it had huge problems, but it worked. So what did this owe to donor assistance? Actually, three things are worth noting. First, DFID provided minimal and cost-effectively um, support. You know, it gave computer stations and so on, which were welcomed. It could equally well be very penny pinching. It wouldn't pay for the chlorine that actually was needed to remove the, the nasties in the stagnant water alongside a, a funded football pitch. Thirdly, and most importantly, it had a wonderful UK police advisor who was sympathetic and respected professional who didn't try to impose what works in any UK city you can think of. Well, unfortunately, the scheme didn't actually last for too long, or not success didn't last for too long because the mayor, the then mayor, wanted more than his share. So, you know, it detracted from the overall success, but it was a very good example of small efforts actually making a big difference. My second example is actually uh, a re-establishing basic policing in Kismayo and Baidoa. Um, this was about pragmatically facilitating the minimal um, requirements needed for the most basic form of policing actually that could perhaps help to facilitate eventually development and uh, stabilization. Again, I'll just make three quick observations. First is that donors invariably have sophisticated, expensive, and incredibly precise lists. But actually, this project is a great reminder that actually policing 
emergent and basic in particular, its requirements are minimal. Forget about strategic vision, police doctrine, blah, 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 all the usual. Initially, at least, and I do stress it initially, it requires little more than sufficient numbers of capable, identifiable, and locally acceptable recruits to be armed, paid, and deployed in relatively safe locations. Secondly, it doesn't provide answers to which rank level it offers the best prospects for assistance. I mean, my own feeling is this is probably mid-ranking, but that's another issue we can perhaps come back to. And then thirdly, perhaps more importantly for this particular seminar scene, the project illustrates the way in which international and local approaches to policing can be mutually accommodated at best. Because anecdotal evidence suggests that most details were actually handled very pragmatically. Neither side made unreasonable demands, and implementation often took the form of a simple, flexible compromise. You know, different reports may state that, that the programme was, was seen as a contribution to building a more inclusive and politically political settlement and all the usual sorts of things that you're only too familiar with. But actually, in practice, Diffid and Amazon hold, involved, handled their involvement very lightly. They allowed the clan-related concerns of elders and local politicians to, to influence the, the implementation. Similar co comments been made, can be made, but actually it did seem to work in a remarkably attractive way at the time. So what conclusions can we draw? Well, donors need to be realistic and they need to be pragmatic about what can't be changed, just as well as what can be changed. They need to accept that Given the complex interplay of actors and issues in non-Western societies, the best that can generally be hoped for is a locally acceptable form of policing that's good enough in the circumstances. And I've got a great quote that sums this up. Slide, please. As Colin Smith, the former police advisor in Bajra, said when he saw a banner outside uh, Baghdad's police college in 2006, just enough is realistic, even if it is discouraging. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alice. Um, lovely background there. I think we're all uh, very much looking forward to, to getting out in, into countryside like that over the next few months. Um, so our next speaker is Andrew Fall, who's going to be talking about re reform efforts in South America. Now, just a, a quick introduction, Andrew. Um, Andrew is a senior researcher in the Justice and Violence Prevention Program at the Institute for Security Studies. He completed his DPhil at the Centre for Criminology in Oxford and has held various academic and practitioner posts, including at the U University of Cape Town, as well as having served as a re reservist constable for over seven years with the South African Police Service. Andrew's research interests cover crime, violence, policing, and human security. And he is currently a uh, project lead at um, the ISS for a collaborative project um, with the South African Police Service promoting the use of ev evidence-based Policing. He's also published widely um, on policing issues and his latest co-authored book, um, Police Integrity in South Africa, is hot off the press, or at least was published in 2020. So I'll pass over to you, Andrew. Thanks, John. Um, just to clarify, I'm, I'm going to be commenting on South Africa rather than South America. Um, but <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. I, think, I think it's clear. It'll be clear. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me today. Um, I'm Andrew Fall. I am a recipient of donor funding in the support of police reform in South Africa. Um, as you can see from my opening slide here, I'm uh, generously funded by the Hans Seidel Foundation, which is a, a German um, foundation that supports our work. Um, just out of interest, this is an image from the early COVID lockdown in South Africa. So these are police officials enforcing the uh, one and a half meter distance between queuing um, people outside a shop. Um, I don't think they fired their, their rubber bullets here, but it's clearly not the, a great image. Just a little bit about the ISS. Um, we are a, a pan-African non-governmental organization. As I say, we are the recipients of the funding that we are talking about today. Um, we work at the national, regional, continental, and international level with partners in a broad effort to promote human security, um, peace, and flourishing in Africa. However, I work in the Justice and Violence Prevention Program, which is linked to the Pretoria office. I'm based in Cape Town, but um, our work, the Justice and Violence Prevention Program, is specifically focused on South Africa, where we 
um, spend most of our attention on policing, prosecutions, um, violence, and um, good governance in general. So I want to start with a bit of a provocation. <clears throat> there's, there's only so much one can cover in 10 minutes. So I'm going to give a broad, a broad presentation um, and we can get into details during the Q&A. But I want to borrow from Peter Singer, the Princeton-based Australian philosopher, and also Will McCaskill at, at Oxford. Um, Peter Singer asks, if you are a wealthy, self-made person with an expensive pair of shoes, you're walking home, you see a child drowning in a shallow pond, do you wade into the pond to save the child um, and damage your shoes? And the, the moral argument is, of course you do, because a child's life is far more important than those shoes. And the loss of those shoes is a very small cost for um, that relatively affluent person compared to the life of a child. Will McCaskill puts it uh, more emotively saying, you, you need not lose anything to run into a house and save a child, but saving that child will stay with you for the rest of your life. It will be a, a defining moment for you. And the argument here is that affluent societies have a moral obligation, um, including individuals and um, more better, better off individuals like myself in unequal societies have a moral obligation to uh, make a small fi financial sacrifice, which can have a massive impact in other people's lives. Now I want to use this experiment to ask questions around policing. Um, would you or would we as a donor community or, or anybody able to intervene, would we save these miners from a life of poverty? These are miners at a Lonman mine. Lonman was a British um, registered company. This is a platinum mine in the northwest of northeast of South Africa. They were protesting in 2012 for what they called the living wage, 12,500 rand a month, which is about 600 pounds. Um, and they were, they were living in informal settlements, they were subject to violence, um, and they were saying, right here, leave our country or give us a living wage. So this international capital needs to leave or give us a living wage. Would you save those miners from poverty or would you save them from a dangerous police response? Um, unfortunately, the state police, the South African Police Service, were called in to manage that protest, and it resulted in one of the greatest tragedies in democratic South Africa, which was the shooting of 112 protesters and the, the killing of 34 of them. Um, so do we intervene with the, at the economic level or at the policing level? Those miners are also living in difficult economic um, circumstances. The economically precarious in South Africa are most vulnerable to violence, which saturates our society as well. So a simple version of our murder stats would be that there are 58 murders a day, but of course, most of those murders happen over weekends and most of them happen in very particular areas. So certain portions of South African society are far more vulnerable than others. Um, how do we protect these miners from violence? How do we protect them from poverty? How do we protect them from police abuse? And I suppose um, <laughs> thinking about the question at the heart of this, this session, um, how can donors support police reform? There isn't a simple entry point, and I think Alice also hinted at this now. Um, you can't simply reform police by engaging with police, but where does one enter to, to, ref to have the greatest impact? Um, do we reform the political structures, good governance, um, democratic elected leaders, uh, or if there are abusive leaders, do we invest in rule of law, criminal justice institutions so that they can hold leaders accountable? Do we uh, support civil society, people like myself who um, provide some kind of oversight and accountability to the state um, as a, as a non-governmental organization funded by foreign money. Um, South Africa is very fortunate to have a, a strong, robust independent media, which does a lot of um, holding the state to account. Um, economy, if we could just click our fingers and give everybody in South Africa, we have 40% unemployment in this country, if we could give everybody a job that paid the same as a police constable, all boats would rise and you would suddenly have an empowered population who could hold the state accountable, they could hold politicians accountable, they could hold police accountable. Um, and then the relationships, how do you tie all of these together? How do you make sure that people like Andrew Fall, working for an NGO, can engage with police who are going to listen respectfully, can engage with the private sector, can engage with politicians, can engage with other civil society actors in the media. And ultimately, I think this is, this is where we really need to make, uh, where we can have the most impact. However, um, I can only do my own little bit and I'll tell you a bit about the project that I, 
I lead at the ISS. Um, my colleagues focus on different areas. We've got some colleagues focusing on police leadership, others focusing on violence prevention, but I'm particularly trying to promote understanding and use and generation of evidence for the improvement of police practice in South Africa. So our goal in this project is for police decisions, plans and activities to be based on the best available evidence for what works to prevent crime and violence and to promote trust. Uh, we have to include the trust element because of course, you can be a very effective um, crime prevention system or structure or institution um, while abusing rights, etc. Um, and South Africa has very low levels of trust and confidence in its police. But um, while I state this, we, and while this is our goal, we still can't pretend that the political leadership, the police leadership, the country's inequality, the poverty aren't at play. South African police officials um, are not neutral bodies onto which we can project um, or inject um, knowledge and understanding about uh, empirical evaluation and the like. They are people who are struggling to put food on the fam put food on the, fa the the table. Even though police salaries are quite decent in South Africa, police officials are part of um, extended precarious net works of unemployed people. And so that salary has to support many people. It can't just um, support the police official. How do we work? We um, do the common sense things that many of us here probably do. We try to convene communities. So we've been trying to foster a community of evidence-based uh, policy-making, research generation, um, research application between police policymakers um researchers in south africa unfortunately this was all obviously destabilized during the pandemic we haven't been able to meet in person for a while but we do do a lot of um communication strategic communication so we have policy briefs we have reports we've got a resource guide we do a lot of media engagement um, and a lot of one-on-one -on -one support to partners when they are willing to work with us so the south african police service <clears throat> excuse me is pursuing a few pilots at the moment um, under this evidence-based policing umbrella. And the Western Cape government, which is a province in South Africa, they are pursuing a quite a holistic violence prevention strategy, um, which includes a focus on evidence-based violence prevention and policing. Um, of course, it's one thing to have a, a vision. It's another thing to get different tiers of government um, and numerous different stakeholders to collaborate to deliver um, an effective intervention. Acknowledging all of these um, challenges and the fact that there are so many different potential entry points, um, I want to close off by suggesting that there is a lesson from the evidence-based policing and violence prevention literature which we could keep in mind for uh, in, in answering this question about effective use of donor funds. So the, the evidence for violence prevention suggests that police and, and violence prevention partners are most effective when they are working cohesively with a shared vision and a shared plan that everybody understands, everybody knows what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what they're working towards. So we're on the same page. Um, we can deploy that plan, we can evaluate it, we can uh, revise it, we can iterate, and in so doing, we keep everybody aligned, we um, generate evidence as we go, and we move forward. Um, and I would suggest that this is one way in which donors can can think about how to most effectively use their money. Um, I think this is obviously most relevant to something like DFID, which is part of a much broader government structure where you will have diplomatic um, aspects involved. You have economic and trade partnerships that can be brought into the picture, um, which is very different to perhaps the, the foundation that funds me, which is a, a German foundation linked to a province in, in Germany and is much smaller than, for example, the GIZ. Um, however, I do think that it's important that we try to align things. Um, I also just want to end by saying, I, I, I think that this idea, Renee Mitchell uh, the, from the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing has a great phrase that too much police reform and too much police knowledge transfer is about common practice, uh, where police practices haven't been evaluated, and so common practice is best practice. I think we just need to nudge ourselves towards intentional experimentation, collaboration, iteration with domestic partners. We need to be careful of soft power and the potential negative view of soft power, uh, neo-colonial type projects, while um, pushing as hard as possible for positive reforms um, in respectful partnership. And I'll end things there and hopefully you can chat some more later. Thanks very much. 
Okay, thank you very much, Anjun. Sorry for confusing South Africa for South America. Um, so our next speaker is um, Tim Heath, um, who is going to be giving us some mostly personal reflections on lessons and principles around good donor practice in supporting uh, police reform. So just a little introduction. Tim is a conflict advisor in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He recently joined the, the new central FCDO team, leading on uh, another acronym for SSR in conflict affected and fragile states. His most recent overseas posting was in Lebanon, where amongst other things, other areas he worked on, UK support to the Lebanese internal security forces and the Lebanese armed forces. Tim was also posted to Jerusalem some years back, where he acted as donor, co-chair of, of the security sector working group alongside the Palestinian Ministry of Interior in Ramallah. Um, and he advised on UK support to the Palestinian security sector in the West Bank. So uh, over to you, Tim. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, there's still still lots of talk of DFID. So I'm in this uh, this merged department from the, brought together the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and uh, and DFID. Um, so yeah, as you said, my my experience and the reflections I'm going to give uh, briefly now uh, are really, I guess, coloured by those places that I've worked on SSR most uh, most closely. Um, so they might not be applicable to all, but I think. I think they probably generally are. They probably don't offer much new, but um, and they're actually relevant to engaging in reform processes more broadly. I, I guess um, I have a, an issue with the the term reform, which is sometimes uh, not appropriate in my the context that I've worked in. But we can we can come back to that perhaps. But uh, I mean, first of all, the security sector is a sensitive sector, right? So um, you need to build up relationships in this uh, in this sector. It can take years. Uh, you really need to build up trust. Um, and invest in that and having the right implementing partners for programs is absolutely critical to that. Um, also donors can have a habit of coming in and out so it becomes very ad hoc, uh, lacking continuity, that undermines trust um, and, uh, and, and can really leave national counterparts floating um, for, often for years. So trying to stay engaged, although we'll come on to some of the reasons why donors may need to uh, disengage, is, is important too. Um, of course, on the on the donor side, governments change, priorities change for funding. Um, funding there are funding cycles to deal with, um, and funding amounts can change over time. So that's those are some of the challenges on the donor side to maintaining continuity. Um, I'd say prioritising and applying understanding of the sector is 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 the fundamental for me. You really need to understand what you're getting into. Um, this is sensitive. These sectors are not just very compartmentalized. They're part of a much bigger political picture. Uh, so gaining an understanding of, uh, of the, the sector and its place in the wider context is absolutely critical. And I think uh, in the past, from my experience, donors have not invested as much as they should have done in the analysis piece. So it's something that certainly in where I've worked over the last few years, we've invested more We've made it a, a, a really core requirement of tendering for, for project um, implementers for new programs, for example, um, to, to demonstrate how partners will invest in analysis, what kind of analysis they can bring to the table and how they'll keep that updated and, and apply it, including in design work, theories of change and so on, right through to monitoring results, frameworks, risk management and so on. Um, so really getting political, uh, political, bringing political economy analysis into, into programs. Um, looking at who the actors are, the champions, the blockers, incentives and disincentives, um, right from big picture, right down to individuals that we're, we're working with and engaging with. And investing in analytical capacity in our national counterparts too. So to make sure that national counterparts have got data, have got the analytical skills to apply it themselves as well for strategic planning and so on. Um, and this is crucial for being conflict sensitive and uh, trying to avoid doing harm, which is very easy to do in this sector if you don't get it right. Um, so whilst implementers are, also, are very important as part of that, um, we can have a, a bit of a tendency to subcontract the relationship, if you like, and subcontract the analysis to implementers. So that's the lesson I've taken away over the last few years is even though you, you might have the best implementers, do invest yourself as, a, as an embassy, in building, maintaining close relationships with national counterparts, doing the analysis and also triangulating the analysis because often program managers and implementers are very, very close. Uh, they're too close almost. 
Uh, sometimes you have to stand back a bit and have a challenge function. Also invest in independent evaluation, of course. Um, be patient, but not too patient. So the kind of change that we're often talking about that's really needed uh, is fundamental. It's very challenging, very difficult. It can upset balances. It can be overwhelming, especially when security actors, the police and others uh, are faced with huge day-to-day -day pressures. Uh, as others have said, you know, they may be struggling to put food on the, uh, on the tables of their families even. Um, so, and it requires cultural shifts. So those leaders also need to be taking risks and we have to be very empathetic to the situation that they find themselves in. Now, it can also be very de destabilizing, as I said, uh, if we get it wrong. So probably more, more than we'd like to, we need to listen to national counterparts and really understand where they're coming from. And to some extent, at least, really go with the pace of reform uh, that they think that they can they can do that they're comfortable with. Um, and part of that is not swamping them. I've seen instances where donors have come in and their implementation model is to take over a whole floor in the Ministry of Interior to run police reform. Um, they take over the car park with their black SUVs. Um, and, uh, and I've seen this really backfire and essentially them being thrown out in the end and it leading to a, a real sort of destabilizing moment with, a, with police reform. But actually, in that case, there were some positives out of that because it led to the ministry really thinking through what it wanted. Um, and there was some, some good experience there of finding a different model that they were comfortable with, that empowered them, gave them visibility um, and uh, really put them in control, but with back office support. Um, so patients also required on the donor side in terms of the, the sort of incentives that we face as donors to spend money when we get allocations we have to spend to quite strict targets, uh, deadlines, which isn't great if one, you haven't got it right from the design stage um, and two, it just doesn't go like that. Um, so you need to be adaptable, you know, use adaptive, uh, flexible programming approaches, but also have a dialogue with those that hold the purse strings. I, I've had cases where I've landed in a, in a place with a given a program saying, this is ready to go. You're gonna spend this much by this, this time and found actually walking into to see the police in the ministry that they're not bought in. In fact, in that case, um, I had to talk my, my uh, manager down to keeping the money on the table, but not spending it for two years before the ministry came round. We've been doing kind of reform in the meantime without programme funding, but in the end, after two years, they knew exactly what they wanted and we supported it. Um, so for me, that was best practice. Um, for my boss, it was not spending the money. <laughs> um, I think also um, donors can encourage progress. Donors have got their own incentives. So uh, often, for example, people will be searching for, okay, what are the results here? Um, we've been investing X amount of money for, for so many years. How can we really demonstrate progress? Um, sometimes those issues will be issues that the, the police really need to tackle themselves as well. So we might be patient with um, uh, strengthening accountability um, and human rights compliance and see incremental progress. But at some point, donor probably needs a little bit more than that. Um, and I, I found that there are moments when we can use capital that we've built up over years of support to really encourage that uh, in, in clever ways, really, by, by bringing evidence to bear um, to senior decision makers in the police or the ministry to show what the benefits of moving forward on that could be. In this case, I'm thinking about survey results, for example, that, um, that show that the public really welcome greater transparency. And that might counteract the risks to internal morale by being more transparent around disciplinary investigations, for example. Um, a link to that is work on supply and demand side at the same time. Now, not all donors can do everything across a sector and be completely holistic, but at least a coordinated approach across donors to make sure that the investment's not just in the, in the institutions, the state, but also on the demand side on civil society, perhaps on parliament and other, other key institutions um, and connecting up the two. So there's a constructive dialogue. Take sustainability seriously. If you don't, it can come back to bite you and really wreck all the progress that you've made. Um, and measure long-term and incremental progress. So it's just something I think we're pretty bad at in terms of taking really long perspective on, on progress over time, which is often very you know, non-linear, of course. Um, but it, all that said, uh, learning the lessons is the easy bit, but applying them in, in specific contexts is really tricky. This is complex stuff. Over.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our last speaker is uh, Liam O'Shea, and he's going to introduce the uh, How to Reform the Police uh, project. So a quick introduction to, to Liam. So he's the Dynam Research Fellow at the Department of International Relations at the LSE. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, he was a government advisor in the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He's worked as a consultant for a number of organisations on security and justice in developing countries, and he's an expert on po uh, politics and police reform in the Formula Soviet Union. Uh, which was the topic of his PhD from St Andrews. At the LSE, he is leading the development of um, this project, www.howtoreformthepolice.com, um, which is a global platform to collate and synthesize the international evidence on police reform. So, so Liam is going to uh, talk about this uh, fantastic project. So over to you, Liam. Thank you very much, John. <clears throat> so as John said, the platform I'm developing uh, aims to synthesize the evidence on how to do police reform, particularly interventions uh, targeted at reducing police violence and corruption. So the problem it aims to solve are, well, first there are evidence gaps. There are evidence gaps, for ex example, on how to reduce police violence everywhere, including in the West. Uh, the evidence on police corruption is, is a bit stronger, um, but the large body of the evidence comes from Western police studies and examples of from Western cases. It also attempts to address some siloing in the evidence. So um, there isn't a great deal of crossover between Western criminology and, for example, security sector reform and international development, although that is improving. And evidence is not always accessible. So as John said, I was in the Foreign Office. Um, frankly, as a practitioner, you often don't have time to read much at all. It's half time is managing your inbox. Um, so evidence has to be made accessible, but it's often dense or behind tables or scattered all over the place. and takes an awful lot of work to be able to get what you need. But there is good news. Um, there is evidence out there. There's a large body of several decades of um, evidence from uh, Western police studies. There's increased uh, research by criminologists from and in the global south, as well as anthropologists. And there's the grey literature from donors from NGOs and civil society. There are also models um, to make evidence more accessible. So the UK developed a number of years ago a number of what work centres that cover various areas of social policy, health, education, local government and so on. Um, and the idea of these centres is to, is to make this evidence more accessible. Now I'm just going to show rather than tell um, so I'm going to share my screen. To give you an example of a what work center. I just get a thumbs up from people to know they can see my great. It's always worth checking. So this is the uh, Education Endowment Foundation. And the reason I really like this is you've got a list of interventions, how much they cost, the evidence strength and their impact. If you click on them, You get more information on what it is, how effective it is, how secure is the evidence, what are the costs, and what else I can, should consider. And the aim of this project is to replicate this for police transformation or, or reform. And it needs to do a number of things. So for first of all, I've, I've built the, the website and the backend systems, which I'll explain. The data you see is just for demonstration purposes and is made up, so don't quote me on anything uh, any of that. But what the platform will have to do, well, it focuses on violence and corruption because these are the most prominent problems in much of the global south and indeed with violence as we're seeing in the global north. It needs to look at both organisational change and reform. I'm going to come back to that bit about reform later. It needs to link the evidence from the west and the global south. Um, the evidence from police studies and criminology particularly strong on organizational level change. Evidence from security sector reform is much stronger on the environments. And it needs to do uh, not just look at what works, but what looks where. Uh, as we saw in Alice's presentation, policing in Mogadishu is very different from policing in Milton Keynes. We can't assume that evidence from the latter is going to work in the former. So this is the landing page of, of, of the platform. As you can see, I've, I've sought to replicate the um, Education Endowment Trust. We have some interventions, costs, evidence strength, 
and impact. Again, this is mock data, so uh, take that bit as a pinch of salt. Let me now explain some of the data behind and the systems behind the platform. So really we have three sets of, of data. First is reference information. It's fairly self-explanatory. Um, this, the, the Zotero, which is a, a reference management software, stores information on the title, author, uh, year of publication, etc., etc. The second set of data is impact and evidence scores. So all the project will aim to do is add um, what we'll use a couple, some methodologies to, to do just that. Um, at, the U, at UCL, they've developed the EMI, EMI methodology, which set, can be used to assess both the impact of evidence, but also the, oh, sorry, the impact of an intervention, but also the, the strength of evidence behind it. And there's a little bit more information on the screen on some of the uh, areas of that looks at. And we also have the prime system, which is used to measure police reform in fragile states, but can be used in more stable contexts as well. And there, there, it has six areas uh, which can be used as indicators. The third set of data in blue is the World, uh, World Bank's governance indicators. So what these enable us to do is analyze the reform environment. Uh, Brian Taylor did this in his book on state building in Putin's Russia, but I think it has application far further. What Taylor did is he averages um, World Bank indicators for governance effectiveness and political stability and violence to come up with a state capacity um, metric. He then uses three other metrics to come up with a state quality metric, which is broadly levels of accountability uh, rule of law, control of corruption. I'm going to, it's easier to, again to show than to tell, but I'll give you an example of how this won't work. This is use of force policy again. Um, so what it has is what is the intervention, how effective it is, how strong is the evidence, and, and below what are the costs and how can I implement it. But this is the what works where piece. So imagine we have 15, 20 studies on use of force, but in different environments. If we have the geography and the time period for when an intervention uh, was carried out, we can pull the data from the world governance uh, data set and then map studies according to um, the, the context in which they, they were they're focused on. So in the lower quadrant, we have fairly low capacity and low state qualities. These are more fragile states. In the, this quadrant here, we have higher state capacity um, but lower um, in state quality, so they're more non-democratic. And in the upper quadrant, we'd have high capacity and, and high state quality, where you'd expect most of the evidence to be. So the next step in the project is to put a team together, um, start coding, organizing, testing the methodology. Um, we have um, a proposal currently out there, I'm very glad to say that Andrew is one of the, the partners of the team with, with the ISS in South Africa. We also have ETAM in Mexico. And the idea is that we have create a team which has investigators from the global south and the global north to begin processing through the data. And it will also need to look at police reform. So most of what I measured is more organizational level change, which is generally more implementable. But as uh, Andrew showed in his graph, um, Indeed, police reform is more complex. So the project will look at deploying comparative political science methodologies to look at comparing what are the more macro variables that affect police reform. Uh, and it will do so by looking at case studies such as police reform in Georgia, Singapore, South Africa and Mexico, um, and using that methodologies to identify those bigger variables. So that's it in a nutshell. I've got three other things to say to wrap up. Um, the first is this isn't the only sort of platform. There are others out there, but they do slightly different things. So the College of Policing has a What Works Centre, but it's more on crime, reducing um, crime than it is on police reform and police violence and corruption. The, the, well, there's also the Global Policing Database in Australia. Uh, a very thorough database, but it doesn't have to provide synthesis, is what I'm proposing. 
The second point is um, we're looking for funding. So if anyone's got any ideas, or indeed if you've got a large pot of funding, um, we have more detailed plans and we're very glad to share those uh, and also to take any ideas you may have on the project, how to improve it. The final thing which I'll end with is this won't solve all the problems because not all the problems are to do with lack of evidence. Uh, I won't go into that, but, but what it will do is help improve the menu. Um, reform windows when they open up are often short-lived and sometimes the people involved don't have the best available information to them on how to deliver reforms. Similarly, having been a practitioner, things can get chucked on your desk and you may not know the best way to move forward. What this project will aim to do is to help provide that, a clear menu to help reduce police violence and corruption. And that's it, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Liam. Fascinating stuff. So, um, we are now turning to Zoha Wasim, uh, who is our discussant, who is going to um, uh, give a brief set of remarks and insights based on the talk. So, over to you, Zoha. Thank you, John, um, and thank you, everyone, for their presentations and insights. Um, it's a privilege to listen to everyone's experiences and their projects. Um, and I've engaged with some of your work in the past, so this, is, this has been really informative. Um, as a discussant, I wanted to briefly summarize and touch upon some of the key themes or recommendations that have come up uh, in, the, in these four presentations. So first we heard uh, about the importance of starting small. So Alice Hill mentioned in the case of Mogadishu that small efforts can make a big difference. Um, and this also helps donors be realistic and, and pragmatic can or what not. On um, this note, he also said that funding can change and leadership can change. So a practical approach or a more sustainable approach that perhaps values smaller efforts um, or more short-term efforts might be more beneficial. Um, secondly, we, we heard about, um, or there was a theme about keeping things local um, or thinking locally. So, uh, and that's linked to the idea or the importance of um, that local and international approaches should accommodate each other uh, which was something that Alice also mentioned. Um, and on that note, we also heard that international involvement or donor interference should be light um, and locally led initiatives and programs are likely to be more successful in, in certain cases. Um, we also heard about the importance of building trust and partnerships, which can promote collaboration with, between different sectors um, and, and, and collaboration with, with, between different domestic partners. With, each partner knows their role and their contribution, and that's something that both Andrew and Tim uh, touched upon. Um, and linked to this is what Tim mentioned about investing in local counterparts as well. Um, and then fourth, fourthly, or finally, we heard about the importance of evidence-based evidence, evidence -based policing, uh, which can help drive police reform efforts. And this was brought out in Andrew's presentation um, and his ongoing project and his work um, with the South African police, but emphasized more strongly in Liam's presentation um, and linking evidence from the West, uh, from the Global South, but which is something that Liam touched upon, uh, but knowing that evidence from certain parts of the world might not translate to other parts of the world, as Liam cautioned uh, in, in our sort of broader efforts at police reform. So I think these were some of the key themes that resonated in each of the four presentations and offered some useful takeaways. Um, and as we transition now from to the Q&A part of the event, I would like to take this opportunity to pose two very open and broad questions, um, broad enough for anyone to take up uh, if there's time. Um, and I think one of them actually was influenced by Andrew Paul's presentation and what he said about having different entry points to police reform in different contexts. So the first question I had was that um, civil society organizations um, are increasingly working alongside social movements or supporting social movements in their calls for police reform or even abolition in certain cases. So how can or how should donors work with civil society organizations that support social movements that take a critical approach to police reform and policing generally? Is there a possibility in the future for donors to see social movements as creating possibilities for collaborations uh, and collaborating on police reform and in initiatives? And can or should donors tap into the influence of social movements to advance calls uh, for police reform 
transparency and accountability. And the second question I had was um, that police reform projects or programs can be quite dividing. So the opinion about them can be quite dividing, even within the police, um, and they might not get much buy-in from certain officers or certain departments. So for example, police reform efforts in Pakistan, uh, which is where the country I focus on, they call for implementation of a specific legislation concerning police administration oversight and management. While certain lobbies support this, it has gotten much resistance from political parties across the country, as well as police officers, partly because of the politicization of the police. But this particular initiative gets a lot of support from civil society organizations, the media, the sector, etc., that want to see policing more depoliticized. In such a situation and in such divided social political context, what should donors do? Whose voice counts and whose input counts? Because ultimately the question is, who will the reform serve? And it's difficult to get all stakeholders to agree on who the beneficiary of reform should be. So whose voice counts and how can donors ensure that their funding and their money is serving the right audience, so to say, for better choice of words, and not politicizing the issue further, um, if that is the important aim of donor-led donor -led police reform efforts. So that's all from me. I'll keep it short and brief. Um, thank you once again for your presentation. It's been a strong finish to our event series. So thank you. And back to you, John. Okay, so thank you very much, Sahai. Um, so could I ask uh, the uh, everyone on the panel to put their videos on for the Q and A? Um, I wondered whether we we should start with Yoha's first Soha's first question, excuse me, um, about um, donors working with civil society organisations to support police reform. Um, I just open it up. Does anyone want to have a go at this question uh, first? I don't mind starting us off. Um, I see Liam might be next. Um, I guess, um, so, yeah. Uh, in fact, Tim's probably best place to answer this. I would think that as a donor agency, you've got so many relationships to manage that you don't want to, um, you don't want to burn bridges by getting behind something that doesn't have majority support. So if, if it is a majority, if there's a majority support in that in that civil society um, movement, then there's less risk. But you don't want to burn your your diplomatic ties. Um, I would think, but but Tim's better placed. Um, and I think from from our perspective as the ISS, I think we are probably often ideologically aligned with um, many grassroots um, protests and the like that might be more abolitionist in their sentiment. But we are the kind of more neutral face of police reform. So we can engage without burning bridges, um, but that means we're less poten potentially less emotional and maybe less honest in the way that we advocate. I'm not sure what others think, um, but I would think ultimately it's about relationship maintenance um, for, the, for the donor. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, I, Andrew mentioned Tim might have something to say. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Tim, but... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, not, not smarter than that, though. Um, but um, no, I think we, we can certainly support pro-reform coalitions um, whilst, uh, whilst, yeah, being very cautious about being seen to back a social movement, which has often, often got a political connotation, of course. But, but and there are often um, a lot of grey areas and overlaps between social movements and civil society and certain civil society partners are, are easier to support than, than others say. So I think there's, there is scope there, but, but also just being very wary about, um, about as a donor, um, trying to get too close. And also, you know, we accidentally do sometimes uh, act a bit pushy to get civil society to do things that we want to do and spend our money on. So, which can be the death of, of social movements and civil society. So. I think, uh, yes, support coalitions, but be, be careful about trying to get too close and, and direct and at the risk of undermining. But, but a lot of this, although one has to be very cognizant of the, the politics in amongst all of this, big P and small P, as long as you're cognizant of that and you get it, I think you can approach this as a quite technical issue. So which kind of takes the political sting out of it, if you like. So, Okay, thank you, Liam or Alison. Alice, do you, you want to? Um, yeah, 
Yes, I, I, I think I would, I would agree with everything Tim said. Um, there is a danger of ignoring the fact that actually this is very much a business opportunity for many civil society organisations. But equally, they may be the only, uh, the only possible way into some of the issues, some of the big themes um, and challenges that, that donors wish to address. So, yeah, it's quite a tightrope, but um, no easy answers, full stop. Uh, and Liam, finally. Yeah, I so one thing that, that struck me, particularly for Alice's, is donors have far less power than is often more commonly thought. Um, and therefore, we need to choose our entry points quite well. And that, that often doesn't happen. So in some contexts, it would be totally appropriate to work with the police. Um, and in other contexts, we might as well forget it and start working with civil society and the coalitions uh, and building those coalitions of, of the willing. And I think a lot more could be done that because actually what often happens is a project starts for whatever reason um, and then uh, it's on a dependency path because we've started a project engaging with the Ministry of Interior of Country X um, and it's been going for a while but actually there's not really the support that wasn't there from the beginning. One interesting though thing I'll put as a slight curveball is I think we also there needs to be more discussion around what to do with or how to manage uh, spoilers in reform because the discussion is often based around um, just the coalitions of the willing uh, but it's not always clear on what to do with those parts in fact it's usually not said what to do with those who are who are not only acquiescing but will actively be opposing. Okay, thank you very much. Zoe had a second question, but I, I want to, uh, we'll circle back to that um, in a little bit. Um, so I want to put a question to um, maybe Alice and Andrew, which is, uh, why isn't there more work critical of assistance? I don't know whether Andrew or, or who wants to say something about that. Why isn't there more work critical of donor assistance? Yeah. Um, well, I, I suppose Alice partly hinted at it in that it's a business for some, so, um, I mean, and, and it, that need not be sinister. Um, th there needs to be funding for um, people to be empowered to act often, uh, particularly where the free market isn't creating um, space for people to, to work otherwise. Um, but I, I do think, it, th I, I suspect that there is Often there are difficult conversations behind closed doors with between donors and partners. So um, again, <laughs> I found Tim's input very interesting in terms of managing those relationships and not forcing things and um, and being giving giving local partners the time and space to act in an in an, in an environment that they are hopefully more familiar with and at a scale that they're hopefully more familiar with. Of course, there needs to be a balance between not having your partner take your money and, and sit there doing nothing. Um, but by the same token, we can't have unreasonable deliverables and, and little tick box performance targets, which mean we, we publish reports that have no impact. Um, so um, I think they are difficult conversations, but probably generally behind closed doors because um, it, those who are receiving donor funds um, wouldn't be served by a public spat. Um, Alice, do you have any thoughts? Um, I think there has been a lot of critical uh, analysis and commentary actually over the past 30 years, because we're basically talking about since the early 90s. Um, but it's become slightly difficult. Are, are we talking about practitioners, um, academics, um, policy makers, or, or some who are straddling various worlds? It's very difficult to, because there might be different answers to all. And I think if we are taking um, donors from you know, industrialized liberal democracies as, as our focal point today, the difference of this world, if you like, let's face it, not only is it a business, but DFID is in the business of actually giving away money. It doesn't exist unless it does it. So um, if you add in that, plus the fact that a lot of people are genuinely, I think, wishing, willing, longing to actually reform, horrible word, actually, I don't really like it, but they're trying to reform um, unpleasant policing, uh, trying to stop others being badly hurt, et cetera, et cetera. Then you begin to understand how quite often over, over those past 30 years, there've been a fair number of missionaries promoting rather than saying, hold on a minute, 
are we actually are, are we doing um, a long term review? And if it comes to that, actually, how many long term reviews do we actually know exist of Diffitt's work or indeed anybody else's work? Um, not the IWS's, for example. Not that very, not that many. And I can only assume it's because actually nobody really wants to know the answer. Because I can't help thinking the answer is, in personal opinion, I know, but actually um, the results have been less than glorious. However, they have actually made a difference in small scale, um, temporarily and locally, as I say. And that actually may be, as our Colombian lady said in my first quote, actually what really matters. Doesn't answer the question to analysis, but actually, Leon, perhaps you should pick up on this, this lack of critical thinking. Um, slightly more or in a rigorously scientific fashion. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you, so you, Alice is right, there has been critical literature. And I think one way of organizing it just for a thought game is um, where does the biggest source of injustice come from? And for some scholars and for practitioners, it's poor institutions. And that tends to be the more donor approach. Um, but there are, there's another set which you could say a bit more realist and it's, it's chaos and underdevelopment in, in various contexts. But there is another set of scholars who, um, who I'd say highlight more the global inequalities and inequalities in the global system and that frames their research. And for them, uh, assistance can be seen as a tool for imposing Western models um, and Western economic reforms, for example. So that um, research does exist. I think where it can be both useful and not so useful. It's not so useful when the fit doesn't fit the problem. So it's all very well talking about global economic um, systematic injustice, but sometimes in the context, it's the wall down the road or the organized criminal or the lack of street lighting, whatever it is. Um, but on the other hand, where the critical comes in is we do, we're talking about systems of coercion. That's what define police. So we need to have this in mind. And um, I know from my own research on Georgia, for example, which is a very, an example of very successful police reform, but it was also accompanied by quite some stringent neoliberal economic reforms. Um, so the question then comes back to, you know, whose order is assistance promoting? So I think it's important to also keep it in mind. Thank you very much. I mean, this, this question was raised in the, um, uh, in the Q and A um, by Martin, um, and yeah, the, the, he was particularly interested in German uh, donor agencies in, in Africa. And there was just, just to say there was a, um, a follow-up comment from uh, Ewan um, mentioning the um, um, EU's border protection agency um, and allegations. Um, so let's move on to, because Alice mentioned she doesn't, didn't like the phrase uh, police reform. Um, so um, someone, in, one, someone in the chat asked, actually it was, it was Martin, um, where is it now? Um, uh, why do donors only talk about police reform and never the transformation of the police? Um, uh, this could be a, a question that maybe Tim wants to start with. Um, I think we all know the, the gist of this question. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I have a problem with the, with the term reform. Uh, I think maybe it works in some concepts, not others. Um, and maybe it's just my own conceptualization sometimes, but, but in this field as well, we kind of wax and wane between different terminology as well. And, um, and I, I'm probably like most other people and come back to SSR as a bit of a lazy shorthand for what we're talking about. But transformation, yeah, for me, we're often just talking about security sector development, really. Even, even if, if one was to go to the, uh, the chief of police in country X and says, we're here to help you reform, um, it, it can be a little bit scary, to be honest, and a little bit um, off-putting. So in a current case we've got, it's really not the moment to be going and talking about reform, even though the, the security forces and the ministries need to be taking pretty fundamental steps to address a major crisis. But it's much, much easier to, to have a conversation around a more strategic response, development, at least maintenance um, of, of progress, rather than reform, which sounds a little bit threatening quite often in the context that we're working in. 
Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, does anyone else want to talk about issues around organisational level um, versus police reform? Um, Martin, uh, in, a, in a comment further down, asked about procedural justice becoming um, uh, gaining traction in northern policing environments. Anyone else? Us. I think it's much more important uh, to look at what police do rather than how they're organised or what they're called or indeed what terms we use. Um, I think it was actually in the first seminar, possibly the second one, where there was some discussion about whether in fact uh, we were really talking not about reform, in quotes, but actually um, trans not transformation either, because that strikes me as far too ambitious. Um, pro Professionalisation, modernisation, and I think those are actually quite good words in a way, because that, in my experience, tends to be what appeals to certainly mid-ranking educated officers. It's one of the attractions of, of these international models that they find that they can, they can um, get personally interested in. Um, actually, pro probably that's enough comment there. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's quite an important issue. Um, actually, the only other comment I will say, yes, I think term, terminology, terms come and go. Again, if you think back to the 90s, uh, DCAF, for example, there they led the way with SSR originally, then it all shifted, then it shifted again. Does it really matter what we call it? But I do think I would just go back to emphasize my first point is that actually what police do is much more important than what they're called or what we call them or what we're referring to. OK, thank you, Alice. Does anyone else want to, to chime in on this? OK, so oh, Liam. Liam, you're muted. That's it. Um, often in security sector reform, we, we talk about the end point, really, of models, visions, uh, what we want to see. Um, but there is less real strong evidence on, on, on the starting point. Um, and how, how do we change that starting point, which is often a very corrupt, patrimonial, uh, violent, not really under the control of the state, maybe implicated in organised crime, might not be all of these things, and there are good people in such systems, but how do we start with that and move on? Because like I said earlier, donors don't have that much power, and if we're looking at how to build Denmark rather than starting with this is what we have and how to nudge it in the right direction, that's a problem. And then there was a question in the chat which I thought was quite interesting about lessons from Honduras. I mean, I know nothing about Honduras, I'm sorry, but... Um, it's a good question because there aren't that many, there isn't that much good analysis of successful reforms um, per se, really. I mean, I, I can know, of, I know of Georgia because I studied it um, and, and I'm aware of Singapore and Honduras, but, you know, that, that analysis, really a deep analysis of what, what has changed um, and led to these things, it isn't as strong as it could be. Uh, we have much more analysis of the problems than we do on, on the solutions. Can I just make a quick comment? It's a good point, Liam. Um, several years ago, David Bailey, who sadly died um, a couple of years ago, uh, asked around uh, his, his sort of circle of friends and acquaintances who knew of a, a normatively driven example of, of reform, of what you could all hold your hand up to and say, yes, this was genuine reform. And the best anybody could manage at the time was, well, Northern Ireland, perhaps, um, Sierra Leone, perhaps, oops, no, no, things have been happening there. And that was it. Nobody amongst this, this circle of actually quite well-known academics and practitioners and policymakers could come up with what could be described as normatively driven reform. So for what it's worth, there are these big issues still sitting Okay, thanks everyone. So, um, so G, G. Leslie asks about um, uh, whether the focus should be on reducing police use of live fire and pro proportional use of force. Um, I don't know whether um, anyone uh, would like to, to tackle that, maybe Zohar. Should that be, should that be the, um, a, a focus, a, attack that first and foremost? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? 
So should the focus be on reducing police use of live fire, proportional use of force? I mean, G. Leslie was was re referring to the sorts of kind of uh, machines that 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 send some you know viscous material that kind of stops people moving around um, as opposed to shooting them. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, we we've seen in certain contexts that uh, the the use of uh, the use of live fire, for example, like in in places like Kashmir and Pakistan. Um, I don't see it happening. I think rolling back um, and reducing the use of force is fairly uh, is fairly difficult in certain contexts, and there's a lot of investment that goes into the militarization of policing. Um, and that's something that I'm I'm not seeing a lot of police reform initiatives target as well. So a lot of reforms that are kind of you know uh, that are given or being implemented um, in certain countries of the global south, they are, um, especially like in South Asia, for example, they do bring in a lot of investment towards the militarization of policing. So I'm kind of critical on that front. But perhaps from other contexts, we've seen um, something different. Um, but I have yet to see, at least in the case of Pakistan, any kind of discussion that prioritizes at the use of less force or non-lethal force. Okay, thank you. Any, anyone else on the panel want to comment on providing non-lethal equipment, etc.? Um, I'll come in for a sec. Um, so, so in South Africa, we, ha we have quite a lot of discussion about use of force and um, much of it is influenced by the Global North. We've kind of 10 years ago, we were talking about use of force policies and the need for better monitoring. Um, and it's another chicken and egg. I think one could could carry out experiments that show that policing can successfully take place without armed police officials. Obviously, we can see it in the UK, but I, but even in South Africa, um, the, the easy knee-jerk response in South Africa is you can't disarm police because um, they'll all be killed. But police are often more vulnerable because they are carrying firearms because that makes them um, a, a target for robbery. Um, but, but, but both linked to interventions around use of force and any other potential intervention. I think it requires strong leadership within the organization already, which, so this, is, this goes back to the kind of chicken or egg thing. Where does one intervene first? You can, you can prove, a, proof, prove a use of force uh, policy efficacy or prove a less than lethal weapon efficacy through an experiment. But if you haven't got good leadership that can then take that that example and and motivate for change in the organization that doesn't necessarily help. So I think we need these multiple entry points. Um, I see some other hands. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I can come in on this. Um, yeah, I think this is this is one of the toughest areas uh, for selling for donors, in my experience. Um, it's really you know, a major interface of where the police meet the public around public order policing. Uh, and it's where it can all go very, very badly wrong. So at the same time as being something that donors really need to be in there, influencing, trying to help change. It's also one of the most risky um, in terms of risk appetite of, of ministers to sign off on this kind of thing. It's a, it's a very high bar. Um, but where I've seen interesting collaborations around this has been, for example, where um, I'll just say international human rights organisations, when they've been doing reports on, uh, on violence by the police and by the army, uh, they've also highlighted the fact that the, uh, the security forces are uh, unprotected. That's leading to uh, more panicky reactions and quicker escalation to the use of, uh, of lethal force. Uh, and I think having that kind of balance and mutual awareness uh, around this, these issues means that there can be a bit more of a dialogue. Um, and it's, so it's not, just about, um, uh, it's not just about providing the equipment, but it's the, it's the dialogue that goes around it in terms of people understanding what the pressures are on the, on the police when they're out, they're not being arrested and so on. Th things like this are very real that can lead to the use of force. And so it may be that actually reducing Police violence might be best tackled by intervening on on force rotation, for example, so that the officers on the street are not um, overtired. There's, there's different ways to, to to cook the same fish. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. There's a, there's a question from Irvin. Um, um, uh, so 
Irvin, I'll just I'll just read out the the comment and then and then the question. So Andrew talked about uh, a violence prevention as well as police reform. We know that Latin America and the U.S. spend big money on punishment without significant impact on violence. If and this is the question: If donors invested in pro proven violence prevention, such as plans and implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, including reducing poverty, improving education, and reducing violence, do we think this would have a, a knock-on effect on reducing violence by the police? I'm happy to respond first. Um, so uh, again, it's the chicken or egg. I don't think you can just, you can only have violence prevention interventions. Um, I, I like um, Thomas Apt's analogy of kind of stopping the bleeding. You need the, the police to respond to stop the bleeding and then the violence prevention interventions and the, the development of uh, a society that can provide dignified um, lives to people with jobs and, and sustenance um, comes after. Um, whether one can provide parenting and, and the like interventions uh, in the absence of effective rule of law, um, I think is would be ineffective. So it, there needs to be a balance. But if one had to choose between them, I would say stop the bleeding with effective rule of law first, um, and so that you can instill long-term violence prevention interventions. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on the panel want to comment? John, I'll, I'll comment if I may. Sure. Um, I read an interesting paper not so long ago by Robin Engels in the University of Cincinnati. And the reason it's interesting is um, it's a review of measures that are commonly recommended to reduce police violence, like introducing body cameras um, and so on. And what interested me is that the evidence is really not very good on those more micro scale interventions. But that's interesting, if not if a bit pessimistic, but it's also that that's where the best evidence lies. Most police studies, a large bulk of it is from, so if it's not great from the West on how to do it, you can be left with a feeling of, well, the evidence base is pretty low overall. I think it's important to acknowledge that, is that the evidence overall is, is quite limited. On a more optimistic note, um, I wouldn't say that there aren't lessons from police studies on how to reduce police violence and, and that the evidence isn't out there. Um, I'm thinking of the work of Clifford Stott on who's written a lot about how to reduce or how to police uh, protests. Um, and it reminded me of um, research I did in Georgia. So Stott basically says that um, if police come in aggressively, uh, it's more likely that the crowd will behave aggressively. And I remember doing an interview with a police officer, an Austrian police officer in Georgia, and he said that the Georgians had had, had learned actually to pr protest, police protest much better. Um, but then after about 10 minutes, they lost it and went back to their old practices and the, the protests became more violent. But I think it's an example of something that could work in the right uh, circumstances. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Li Li Liam. So there's a question from G. Leslie, uh, another one, um, asking whether um, compulsory ongoing evaluation mechanisms uh, should be key to provision to all uh, police funding reform. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on, on whether we should the, the 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 viability of attaching compulsory ongoing evaluations to, to these sorts of things whether that will be successful the importance i'm happy to come in but i'm also don't want to look like the the mic hogger so does anyone else want to go first <laughs> go ahead tim i was going to say you go first i'll come in after you <laughs> Okay, well, I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the idea that we want to promote evidence-based practices, um, it, we would want there to be built-in evaluation with anything. However, one doesn't want evaluation to become a, a tick box process that one does on the side, which produces evidence that doesn't tell us anything. And, um, and I think that is, that's a big danger. If, I, if we look at performance management systems in police organizations, the CompStat type spin-offs, um, the South African Police Service has a really impressive performance management system. It's called the Efficiency Index. 
um, but it ends up providing perverse incentives that lead to poor policing or undemocratic policing. So if everything's going to be about measuring reported crime, then um, I just turn you away when you try to report your crime and my performance goes up. So we just need to be think very carefully about what we're measuring, how we're measuring and, and whether it's actually helping us. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I always say build evaluation into the design of the program, right, which um, uh, I see not always done great. I don't know how to do it as well as I wish I, I could. And it's it's challenging, but also you need to be able to adapt your evaluation as as, change, as, as the context changes. Um, but I think one of the th things around evaluation that I'm really, really up for is, is doing more joint donor evaluations. Um, it's something that we're getting into a bit more now um, in partnership with ISAT, uh, for example, of uh, some joint donor programs in, in Africa. I think there's a lot more scope to, to do that. It does take more, more preparation um, and donors coming together to agree when evaluations are going to be um, held, how they're going to be funded, what they're going to uh, focus on so they do um, satisfy each donor requirement, if you like. But that's, that's something where I think there's a lot more scope to, to collaborate on. Okay, thanks both. Anyone else on the panel or is that who I want to? Now, Zohar, Zohar asked a, a second question, um, which was about how, ensuring money, how that money is well used and not politicised. Um, it, it was a very eloquent uh, question. I wonder whether you want to just repeat the whole thing so, I, so that my attempt to summarise it doesn't do uh, damage. Yeah, to the sure. I can I, I try again. Um, I think the question was basically that um, sometimes when reform programs or efforts are introduced, um, the, the, the sort of buy-in can be quite divided. So you have support from certain sectors, such as civil society, for example, or the judiciary um, and NGOs, etc., and the media, um, but you might not find that much interest uh, or that much political will, let's say. Uh, or that much uh, um, commitment from certain police officers. So then how do you kind of manage that kind of divided commitment towards uh, a police reform uh, initiative or a program? Um, and, and when you have so many stakeholders, then whose voice counts or who is the primary audience um, in such a situation? I think it was something along those lines. So he wants to have the first go at this. Tim has his hand up. Oh, it's a legacy hand, but um, <laughs> uh, very, very tricky. Um, I mean, I think go, you have to go back to the really uh, trying to get your head around the incentives and disincentives. I mean, I think you know if you if you try to to effectively put leaders in a position where they're taking responsibility and having visibility, um, there's a risk it can backfire if they're not really on board. Um, so, um, in some cases, you know, it's been a case of mapping who are the people behind the immediately obvious people who might be more on board and might have the ear of those people uh, who, if you, you can also help provide them with the right evidence, for example, or experience from, from another South case. Uh, that they can bring to the attention of their seniors um, to, to keep them on board. I mean, I think there is, in this sector and, and, and all the others, really, there is always the, the risk that donor support is, is used to legitimise um, security actors that really are not legitimate. So the way that you, you build that into your risk management um, processes, your political messaging and so on is, is critical and, and seeing when it's happening. Maybe, and maybe using the capital from that sometimes to push a little bit to for things like accountability. Great, thanks, Tim. Anyone else on the panel? Um, is I, I've got a uh, question that comes from this, which I think isn't ans asked actually by enough donors, uh, and it should be asked very early on is, how much are police paid? And how much, how does that pay relate to the living, uh, living standards? Um, if police are not paid, but they are authorized to use force and power, they will use that power in corrupt ways. And that's just, that's just the way it is. Um, and many police across the world are actually more like more predatory involved in organized crime than we would like. And if you're dealing with that, well, 
it's not exactly a great starting point. Um, obviously, then donors, the question comes around, well, how do you manage that? And some, I think often you can't, right? You might have to go look elsewhere. You might have to demand, uh, raise demands for adequate salaries, if that's possible. You might even have to pay salaries. Um, and indeed, uh, and that was something Alice touched on, was like, what are the basic, what's the good enough? Um, and I think more attention should be paid to the, the good enough, in particular that question around police pay. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a very good point actually, because um, stipends are actually one of the biggest issues for, don for donors in Somalia, because the question of stipends actually dominates many discussions between Somali officials, politicians and officers and donors to a detrimental effect. Um, but linked to that, there's also another similar question, actually, which is, why should we expect police to behave um, what, relatively kindly towards um, the, uh, what do you want to call them, residents community? Again, the, not the terms change. When they, they themselves may actually be untrained, unpaid, and treated like animals. This actually came up repeatedly in, when I used to work on Nigeria, because mid-ranking and lower-ranking officers would say, of course you can't expect us to do any differently. We're treated like animals, particularly when we're trainees, when we do receive something akin to tra training. And I think well, that's a, a comparable issue for many countries, not Somalia, but actually but for many countries. Uh, so training needs to be in there too. Um. I think I lost connection while Liam was speaking, but I, I gather you were talking about salaries and, and Alice picked up on that. Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, my understanding of the research is that um, salaries only make a difference in terms of police behavior if police can't kind of meet their basic needs. Um, and so I just, and I, and I think obviously we want everybody to have dignified lives and to, to have a living wage, um, but I don't think we should fall into the trap of the discourse that says only expect uh, decent behavior when um, people are paid well. And um, so in South Africa, police will complain um, about not having enough money, and yet the starting salary puts them in the wealthiest 5% of income earners in the country. That isn't, uh, so they're not getting an unjust salary um, for the country, it's just that the country is so unequal um, that there's a massive problem. So we, we, I just think we need to uh, identify the nuance. Um, but I also wanted to say, following on from what Tim was saying, I think uh, in response to Zaha's question, um, it would be useful for if, if, a, if a foreign donor government in particular is working directly with police on a particular issue, but they're also working with civil society bodies like ours, um, it would be useful if we were aware of that, because you might find that Yes, they accept my proposal that I want to promote evidence-based policing, and yet they are bringing a police official over to um, tell war stories about uh, policing in London, and those war stories coming from a police official might be more emotive to a police ear than uh, Andrew Fall talking about dry research, um, and so it would be useful for the civil society to know that there's this other thing going on so that we can, as I say, better align these things. That they need not be in conflict, but we don't want to undermine one another's projects um, unnecessarily, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, there's a couple more questions, but I, th I really do think uh, that with one minute left, it's probably not wor worth bro um, brokering them. So, so perhaps I can just finish um, by saying thank you to everybody on the panel and thank you to Zoha for the discussant.